There is no greater metaphor in the Bible that describes God's love and His unending concern and care for His people than that of a shepherd. In describing the ministry of Jesus, Matthew states in his gospel that Jesus literally went everywhere uh, to minister to people, teaching, preaching, and healing all that were sick in cities and villages, in synagogues and homes, on mountains, and even by the seashore. There was no place where Jesus would not go. Why? Well, because that's where the people were. And so Matthew said that when he, Jesus, saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. You see, Matthew wanted us to know that Jesus is very aware that life is sometimes hard and unforgiving. And so Jesus was moved with compassion because he wants to bring rescue on every level, to redeem, to lead, to feed, to guide, to protect, and to care. You see, that's what a great shepherd does. You know, I remember back in the day when I felt dazed and confused about the direction of my life. I knew I was called into full-time ministry, and, and I knew the timing was right. And so I left my career and I decided simply to obey and trust God. It felt, it felt as though I like jumped out of the nest and I left familiar surroundings and a predictable future to fly on my own. But I found out quickly that flying solo was really not God's intention. He wanted me to become fully dependent upon Him. You know, David said it this way in uh, Psalm 23 in the Living Bible. He said, because the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. And that was really one of the first principles I learned early on in ministry, that, that God is watching out for me and that he cares for me and that he will meet all of my needs according to his riches and glory. And so for me and for many people, Psalm 23 has been a go-to psalm when life suddenly spins out of control and comfort, care, and security is needed. I'm Pastor Gary Comas. I'm concluding my series today that I began last week entitled The Shepherd and the Host, unpacking the practical applications of Psalm 23. We learned in our last session that the overarching theme of Psalm 23 really speaks to the faithful provision of the Lord for His people, both spiritually and physically. This psalm encourages all of us to look for the visible manifestation of God's presence in life through our daily experience, as well as uh, a renewal of our commitment with Him through our church experience. So here's, here's what we learned so far. A couple of things. Number one, we all need to be taught God's Word. I'm reminded of what Solomon said in Proverbs chapter 4, starting at verse 20. He said, My son, attend to my words, incline your ear to my sayings, God is simply saying, hey, put the word of God first place and incline your ear to my sayings. That literally means that lean away from the sayings of the world and lean into my sayings. Put the word of God first place, incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them, protect them in the midst of your heart. For they are life to those that find them and health to all their flesh. And then he says this, keep your heart, protect your heart with all diligence for out of it will flow the issues of life, the forces of life. And so we all need to be taught the word of God. And when we are taught, number two, we begin to see that there are areas of our lives that really need cleansing and restoration. 
Paul said it this way, remember? He wrote to Timothy and he said, all scripture is inspired by God uh, and is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. And so when we are taught, all of a sudden the eyes of our understanding are enlightened. We begin to see things that need to be changed and cleansed in our lives. And that leads us to the next point. Number three, when we are cleansed, we will then discover God's guidance in right living. And then number four, as we follow his guidance, we will then find protection and provision in his house. So think of it this way. When we are taught, we will see, we will live, we will be. Now, through the first four verses of Psalm 23, David reveals God as a divine shepherd. Let's take a quick look at these verses once again. Verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now we learned immediately that God is, number one, a feeding shepherd. We saw through the scriptures that when it comes to shepherding in the eyes of God, Feeding the sheep is job one. God wants us to grow uh, and be strong in the things of God. We also learn when David said, the Lord is my shepherd, this was not only conveying intimacy, the, the Lord is my shepherd and I belong to him and he belongs to me. He's my shepherd, but it also conveyed a principle. Because God is my shepherd, he oversees my feeding. We then learned in point number two that God is a personal shepherd, meaning that God provides the pasture that you and I ought to be grazing in, that we just don't go indiscriminately out anywhere to, to graze. No, he's my shepherd, and so he's going to feed me. And we, we see this uh, this point here in, in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15, God says, I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and, and understanding. And so God is in charge of our feeding. And so he, he wants to feed us with the knowledge of his word and the understanding of his nature and his character. And so for God, it's really all about feeding. And then we learned, number three, that God is a caring shepherd. What did David say? He restores my soul. Sometimes, you know, we move away from the things of God. Sometimes we move away from unhealthy relationships, or I should say healthy relationships. And sometimes we move away from the truth that we once knew. So when God restores us, you know what he does? He brings us back to the place of departure so that he can reveal to us the reason why we left in the first place. And he does so because he wants to bring healing and wholeness to our lives. You see, God is in the restoration business. And then David said in verse 3, he restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness. For his name's sake, we learned then that God is, number four, a guiding shepherd. He leads me. He guides me uh, along right tracks. That's what it literally means. Paths of righteousness speak to right tracks so that you and I can find our way home safely. He will lead and he will guide. And then finally in verse 4, David said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, 
they comfort me. Here we see God as a protecting shepherd. David is showing us that the Lord will always intervene in the circumstances of life and really offer his protection as well as his provision. He does so because he is our shepherd. That's what shepherds do. The Lord is our shepherd. Now, let's move ahead to uh, some new content. Let's take a look at verse 5. All of a sudden, the scene changes from the pasture to the banquet hall and the image of God from the shepherd to the gracious host. So, verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. So the first thing we see is that God is, number one, a gracious host, and we are his honored guest. But I have a question. Where is this meal taking place, and where do the guests gather? Well, the answer, of course, is in God's house, right? I mean, God is the host. Uh, He's preparing his table. His table is in his house, right? I mean... You know, if you're inviting me to your table to have a meal with you and your family, my next question is, is, where do you live, right? Your table is in your house. My table is in my house. God's table is in his house. By presenting it in this way, you know what David does? He helps us answer the important question. Why should I go to the house of God? Now, look, we need to answer this question, especially in today's culture and society, because going to the house of God is devalued today. Many people, unfortunately, dismiss the importance of going to the house of God. And so we need to answer this question for several reasons. Number one, because you need to settle the issue. Do you go out of obligation? Do you go to the house of God to make someone else happy? Uh, Do you go to the house of God to meet people? You you, you gotta answer the question, why do I go to the house of God? Because, number two, there are many things that compete for your time. I mean, you can use this time on a Sunday morning to sleep, right? I mean, you don't have to come to church and sleep in my service right? Go home, (laughs) sleep, relax, and you can, there's a lot of things that compete for your time. You can do a number of good things on a Sunday morning. Why do you go to the house of God? You need to answer the question because uh, culture and society today tend to dismiss your presence here because attending church is frowned upon by some, because attending church somehow labels you by society, and because attending church somehow challenges who you are in culture today. So you need to have a solid answer to the question, why do I go to the house of God? So let me provide for all of us Uh, a concrete answer uh, from the scriptures uh, to remind us why it really is important to physically attend the house of God. I'm just going to share three verses. Uh, There are many that really speak to this issue, but I just want to share three. We begin with Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 3. So the prophet says, and many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that, here it is, that he may teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. Here's another one in Psalm 27 in verse 4. uh, David says this, One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Well, why? To gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Here's one more. 
Psalm 63, verses 1 and 2, David once again says this, O God, you are my God. Sounds like Psalm 23, O Lord, you are my shepherd. O God, you are my God. Earnestly, diligently, early, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Look at this. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary. I mean, he's going to the sanctuary and he hungers after the presence of God. Why? Look, beholding your glory and your power. So here's the picture David is painting. God has given each and every one of us an open invitation weekly for all of us to come to his house because he has prepared his table with a meal to feed us as his honored guest. So based on these verses alone, and as I said, there are many more, but based on these verses alone, we can answer the question. I choose to go to the house of God because, number one, in his house, he will teach me his ways so that I could walk in his path. Number two, in his house, I can gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. I mean, you're getting enveloped in his presence. Gaze upon his beauty and to inquire of God, the direction for my life. And number three, in his house, I can behold his power and his glory and become actively engaged within a community of faith. I mean, think about it. We go to God's house. I want to I not only see a demonstration of God's power as he begins to transform lives. I want to experience transformation in my own life, to, to experience the anointing of God through the teaching and the preaching of his word, through awesome worship where we're not only worshiping alone somewhere, someplace, you know, we're together with the family of God, the body of Christ, where we come together, we pray together, uh, we encourage one another in the word, we love one another. Why? We are a family. Didn't Jesus say it this way? A house divided cannot stand no, 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 no. We need to come together on a consistent basis. That's why I go to the house of God. And that's why the writer of Hebrews said it this way, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Somebody else made this point this way. They said, when you leave church on Sunday, you go to your car and you make your way home, or maybe you visit family or friends, or you go out to eat. As you drive, you will deplete the reserve of gas in your tank. You don't have to be a bad person for your car to go from full to empty. You just have to use your car. Many times when people leave church, they are spiritually full because of the time that they spent worshiping God and hearing the word of God, experiencing God's spirit, fellowshipping with other believers. However, within hours of being filled, their spiritual tank will begin to dissipate. All a person has to do to lose the filling they received is to live life. Life has a way of draining out the reality of the presence of God in you. Just like a person who drives a car must continue to make trips to the gas station to fill up and make the car run smoothly, Christians must continue to attend church consistently to be filled by what God does in and through the body of Christ. Somebody say amen to this. I mean, that's just practical stuff. And really, it's a good reminder of why we choose to go to the house of God. And so the whole idea of the sanctuary, according to David, is to provide a place where God's people can come out from the mass of humanity as the church, to retreat from the conflicts and the chaos of life. 
from the daily routine and the endless demands to a place to be restored and renewed and refreshed, to a place to be encouraged and empowered by the presence of God, to hear a word from God and experience the power of the Holy Spirit. And where do we hear this word? Well, in the sanctuary. And where is the sanctuary? Well, take a look at verse 5. David says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. So notice, number two, God is now a compassionate host. Uh, what do we see? He's inviting us to come in from the battlefield of life to gain strength and maybe uh, heal our wounds and from the enemies that seek to oppose and harass us, from the enemies that seek to steal, kill, destroy, and devour. He's inviting us to come in, uh, giving us a retreat from the things of life that we all deal with on a daily basis. Sometimes we get beaten down by life. Remember uh, what, what Matthew was describing, that, that people were harassed. Jesus noticed this, that they were harassed and, and uh, they were troubled uh, by the uncertainties of life and like a sheep not having a shepherd. And so God is calling us in to come to his house to sit down and eat and drink amid danger, right? The sanctuary is, is really um, in the presence of our enemies. Uh, but yet in complete safety and security. How comforting is it to know that we are never alone in life's battles? God is always with us. He knows exactly what you're going through right now. The season of life you're in right now. Um, facing the uncertainties of life, wondering what the next step is. God knows and, and, and I'm here to remind all of us, he is your shepherd. He's your great shepherd. And he's walking side by side with you. He will lead you. He will guide you. He will empower you. And you're going to make it. God's got this thing. You know, the Bible says in, in Hebrews about Jesus, chapter 1, verse 3, it says that, that Jesus is upholding all things by the word of his power. You're in that and I'm in that. He's upholding you and me. And so we put our faith and our, our trust in him. He has promised us his unfailing presence to lead, to guide, and to even carry us when necessary. He loves you deeply. He's your shepherd. David is suggesting, come to the house of God where he provides bread for the battle and food for the fight, all in an atmosphere of security and peace. And you know what? Your enemies, they have to stand there watching you eat from the table of the Lord. Somebody say amen to this. They can't stop it. No. They're not your shepherd. No, God is your shepherd. He invites you into his table for you to be replenished and refilled. Now, for those who have been invited to God's banquet to eat from his table, but do not come consistently, usually stay away, not because they don't love God, not because they don't love God's people, the family of God, but simply because they may no longer be hungry. I mean, hungry for the teaching of God's word, hungry for his presence, hungry for training in righteousness, challenge and growth, hungry for fellowship with other believers. And the reason why they may not be hungry is because, well, they could be full of other things. Uh, have you ever ruined your appetite for a good meal because you ate junk all day? I think we could all shake our head to that, right? We've done that. We've been there, right? So what do we do? We need to, we must learn to value, protect, and guard our place at the table of God. 
by not indulging ourselves with things that either waste our time, distract us, or draw us away from his table. The second half of this verse contains the the image of a host now with anointing oil. This is so important. Take a look. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Look at this. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Notice God is our number three empowering host. Here David is referring to the custom that it was the duty and delight of the gracious gracious host back in the day to give uh, the guest scented perfumed oil to freshen up, especially after being out in the world exposed to the elements. So throughout the scripture, I I think we all know this, that oil was always symbolic of the Holy Spirit and his anointing. It also signifies richness and happiness and honor. So what David is saying is that God is really the source of my joy. I mean, he's the source of all that I am and all that I hope to be. He's the source of my happiness, my honor. David is saying, he's the source of my success, who provides for my comfort and refreshment and and guidance and, and the empowerment that we need from the Holy Spirit. God is the source of all of this. And so what this means for, for you and for me is this, when we come, listen now, when we come to the house of God, let us come expecting an outpouring of God's Spirit and God's presence on all who attend because God is the source of everything we need. Let's come to initiate a move of God. Don't just drag yourself in tired and, you know, disconnected. And No, no, no. Come in prayed up. Come in believing God. God knows what you need. He knows what we all need, and we come and we offer to God our worship and our faith and our love, and and let's believe God for an outpouring of of His anointing to, to break every yoke of bondage that we may be experiencing or others may be experiencing. I mean, God, there are needs every time you come to church, because if the church is filled with people, uh, needs are present. And God wants to meet those needs. So let's come expecting the power of God to move, the anointing of God. You know how how important the anointing of God is? In Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27, it says that the burden will be removed and the yoke of bondage will be destroyed because of God's anointing. Say, Say amen to this. I mean, this is powerful stuff. Let's come believing God for transformation and change in our lives. Amen? David then says this in verse 5, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Notice God is, number four, a providing host. In other words, my cup is filled to the brim, to the point where it starts spilling out. And, uh, you know, the Bible um, describes the cup. It's a symbol of one's portion or lot in life. Uh, you, you remember this. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was praying about to go to the cross, and he said, he was praying to God, Father, uh, if it be your will, take this cup from me. His lot in life. His portion was to give his life for each and every one of us to die on the cross. So the the cup represents our portion in life. And in a banquet hall, back in the day, the cup would always be filled with choice wine. So what is David saying? He's saying that, that the Lord has filled his life with good things. Choice wine. God is a good, good father, and uh, he wants to provide for his people uh, abundantly. The scripture says 
in, in Psalm chapter 5 and verse 12, it says that God surrounds you with his favor like a shield. Back in the day, you know, when you think of a shield, many people think of this, you know, the circular shield that, that the, the Romans, you know, held on their arms and, but the shield that we're talking about here was a full body shield. You've seen those as well where they, they, they plant that in the ground and they're able to hide behind it. Notice it says God surrounds you with his favor like a shield to protect your life. I mean, you're favored of God because you're his child, right? Here's another one. Psalm 35, 27, the Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Yeah, he does. Just like you as a father or a parent, a mother would have pleasure when your child does well. Well, God takes pleasure in the prosperity of his children. How about this in the New Testament? James chapter 1, verse 17, you heard this, right? Every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. God never changes. Every good gift comes from him. And here's one more, 1 Timothy 6, 17. Speaking of God, Paul says it this way, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. How many of you know that God really wants you to enjoy life? Certainly life is not perfect. Certainly we have issues, trouble, chaos, confusion, battles to deal with you know, unlovely people. I mean, you go on and on. I mean, that's why God wants us to come to his house. Come on a retreat. Let me feed you. Let me give you a great meal where you can take the truth of God's word and go out into the battlefield of life again. Let me empower you with the Holy Spirit. You see, God wants us to enjoy life and be empowered. And then, um, uh, this, this idea of the cup overflowing summarizes all that has gone on before, showing the heart and the desire of God to provide your life with abundance. Remember, Jesus said, remember in John chapter, uh, chapter 10, Jesus was talking uh, about himself being the good shepherd. And uh, remember he said this, he said, the thief, comes not but to steal, kill, and destroy. And I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And so as the good shepherd, he provides for us an abundant life. That's what David is saying here. And now we get to verse 6, and this marks the conclusion of this psalm. And so he said this, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So the focus here, you can see, is on the provisions of God and continual communion with him in his house. David speaks of goodness and mercy. Mercy here is translated uh, as loving kindness, steadfast love, and loyal love. The Hebrew word for mercy here is hasid, and it's considered one of the most important in the vocabulary of the Old Testament theology and ethics. And so there are three basic meanings to the word. Number one, strength. Number two, steadfastness. And number three, love. Strength and steadfastness suggest the fulfillment of a legal obligation. You know what David is saying? Goodness and mercy will follow me. He's saying that God declares himself legally bound to you because of his covenant, which means uh, in your weakness, he becomes your strength. It, isn't that what, what Paul said? In my weakness, he is strong, right? Why? Because he's in covenant with you. And this speaks of love and a, a marital kind of love, including devotion, truth, reliability, faithfulness. God is a faithful God. And finally, goodness. It refers to which promotes or protects 
produces and enhances life. So David said that this goodness and this mercy shall follow me. It means to pursue or to run after. This is saying that God will pursue you every step of the way, meaning he will not let you out of his sight. I mean, he's in covenant with you. He loves you. He will pursue you. David, he knows this, and he says it this way for a reason, because David has been pursued by many enemies in life. And what he is saying is this, no one, Absolutely no one has chased me more persistently and effectively as the Lord, as my shepherd. I mean, he's right there. He's like my shadow. He's standing beside me. Jesus said it this, this way, I will never leave you nor forsake you. In John 14, he said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And he did so in the power of the Holy Spirit. So after all of this, what is David's conclusion? Psalm 26, he said, I'm sorry, 23, verse 6, he says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Here it is. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He brings us back to God's house. To dwell means to, to abide and to remain. David's conclusion is saying this, God's goodness and steadfast love follow him and seem to draw him back to the place where God's provisions could be fully realized in the sanctuary. He wanted to be in the house of God. Actually, he, he wanted to live in the house of God. David loved the sanctuary. Read the Psalms. Uh, he loved the sanctuary. He loved God's house. So in writing this Psalm, David presents the Lord as the shepherd and the host. But in doing so, he reveals these characteristics of God within the context of his house and his sanctuary. And so the idea is this, if you want to truly benefit from the Lord being your shepherd and your host, then you must be consistently present in his house. That's the message here. You know, when the Ark of the Covenant was brought back to Solomon's temple, the people of Israel gathered to worship. They went to the sanctuary. In 2 Chronicles chapter 5, starting at verse 13, let me read a few verses. And it was the duty of the trumpeters and the singers to make themselves heard in unison in praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. And when the song was raised, the trumpets and cymbals and other musical instruments in praise to the Lord, for He is good for His steadfast love endures forever. Look at this. The house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. I mean, God showed up. The Bible says that he inhabits the praises of his people. Literally, it means he sits down when we are worshiping, worshiping him in reckless abandon. And notice the glory of God filled the house so much so that everybody fell out under the power of God. The priest could not stand to minister because of God's glory. In the book, Revival Praying, the author Leonard Ravenhill suggests, faith's, faith's supreme longing is for the return of the glory that has departed from the sanctuary. If we today could rediscover, listen to this, the virtue in that name, the victory in that name, the violence in that name, we could set this world alight for God. What a powerful quote. How true is this? 
if we could come expecting a move of God every time we come to church, prepared, prayed up, believing God. Come on, we're a body. We know other people have needs, and you may know some of those needs. And maybe you're okay, and maybe you don't have a present need right now. Praise God for it. Well, hey, come praying that, that God will touch your brother and your sister in the Lord. You know what they're going through. Who knows, God may, God may use you to bring assistance to someone else. As we listen to the Word of God being preached and taught and we worship God together, let's believe God for His glory to overwhelm us. Hey, even to the point where we fall out under the power of God. Would you love to see that on a consistent basis? It can be done. Let's value the house of God. Let's honor God's presence. Um, He's the host. He's the shepherd. He's prepared a meal. Let's come and eat, and let's give Him glory and honor. And so the house of God, it represents the place of teaching and instruction, the place of fellowship and worship, the place of forgiveness, restoration, and right living, the place of God's protection and provision, the place where the body of Christ abides together in God's presence and fullness. David desires to be in that place. I pray we all have a desire just like David, that we're standing before, number one, our gracious host. God is our gracious host. Number two, he's our compassionate host. He calls us in on a consistent basis to come out and retreat from the battles of life. Number three, he is our empowering host. He anoints us with his spirit and fills us with his word. And number four, he is our providing host. Let's make a decision today, all of us together, that We will value the presence of God in the house of God and make every effort to be a part of the body of Christ and worship together and honor Him together as we receive the best that God has for each and every one of us. Would you do that with me? Let's pray. Let's believe God together. Father, we just thank You for Your Word. Thank You for who You are. You are a good, good Father. You're our shepherd, our great shepherd, and Lord, we're your sheep, and we need you. People that are needing you right now, Lord, I pray as the shepherd you would meet needs um, according to your riches and glory. There are people that need healing. There are people, Father, that are harassed right now, and uh, you know they're, they're struggling. They're going through battles. Lord, I pray that you would touch them in a way that only you can. Lord, we pray all of these things that you would inspire us and that we would make the decision right now. Hey, next Sunday, we're coming to the house of God. Everybody say amen to this. Amen. God is good and God is faithful. Well, I enjoyed preaching this to you today. Listen, you don't get it all in one session. Nope. Go back. It's going to be on our website and uh, study along with us. And, uh, uh, and you know what you do? Pass it on to a friend, family member. Let's grow together in the things of God. God bless you, and I'll see you next week. Hey, thank you so much for joining with me today. I would love to hear how this message impacted your life. Tell me what spoke to you, and especially how we could pray for you. If you'd like to support us financially, just follow the prompts on the screen And that will enable us to continue with our mission here at Faith Community Church, which is transforming individuals and families through the gospel into empowered followers of Christ. I pray your life was empowered today by the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Also, please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel. This way you can stay up to date with our latest content. Once again, thanks for joining with me. And remember, together, we are living truth, changing lives, and loving God. God bless you.